apertado Pre Tá preparado, prepara-se e faz com cuidado Cuida-se, tem demasiado Felizar do quem começou Atrasado quem completou É de todos que aguentou Che, como é Jô? Quem falou que isso vai durar? Quem falou que é para arrebentar? Que é para arrebentar? Puxa, Jô, boa! So the Goethe Institute has a global theme, future, and about a year and a half ago we got together with our network in Sub-Saharan Africa, workshopping ideas of what we could do with that theme. And something that really strongly emerged was that there was more and more African artists who were dealing with issues of future in their work, whether they are visual artists, writers, musicians, um, wanting to claim perspectives of their own of what the future is and especially what an African future is or could be. Hello. <laughs> the best efforts of the ANC government will not stop us from being a borderless con continent. <laughs> and in the last four or five years, there's some, been some kind of a moment of a critical mass of arrival where we are seeing the change of God and we are seeing into the future. And nothing articulates this better than what has happened with um, the fees must fall, and the other movements that have built up to it over the last year or two. So we sit here, I sit here in Nairobi, and we are watching you becoming the leaders of this whole Africa thing. So the question that has been put to ask is, where do we go from here? Answering that question presupposes that we, we have somewhat properly delimited the here. One thing strikes me about the current state of things in our continent and for that matter in the rest of the world. It is that almost everything is up for grabs. All disputes are reopened. We are experiencing a deep moment of unsettlement. Nothing is settled. And we see it here in our own city that which is going on on our campuses. We are speaking about tomorrow, today. This is important. We are looking towards the future from now. Okay. Which is why I would like to propose that you think, understand, appreciate that today's presentation is about projecting towards a time from a place called now. How can you dream a future when the material conditions in which that dream is birthed are defined by lack, by impoverishment. Is the future a taunt? Is the future an event or is it an idea? Is the future a perpetual horizon? Is the future post-political, post-social, post-technological? Is the future post-human? They say we're so crazy, but uh, we don't care. Our surrealism is 
They say we're so crazy, but uh, we don't care. African pioneers, Africans invisible. It seems to me now that um, we are now in the case of a leopard uh, changing his spot because culture feels quite static to me at the moment. We are reading the same fucking book and dancing to the same fucking tune. That used to be the mainstream, now it's just the ocean. So what is it that we do? And how do we learn what we know? I want to go back to that brilliant formulation, Angazi, but I'm sure. I do not know about African futures, but I'm sure the future is African. We mustn't think of the future as a string of events waiting to unfold, but a boundless field of possibilities competing to be materialized. Even though we cannot predict events in the distant future with any certainty, this doesn't prevent us from imagining what might be possible. These possible futures, even if not scientifically accurate, can effectively serve as lighthouses. They can help us steer the course of history away from scenarios we wish to avoid towards the ones we prefer. I think that if we continue to have conversations where technology is an us versus them um, thing, then we need to look at ourselves because we are the creators. And if technology is flawed, it's only because we ourselves are completely flawed. And we should really be looking more at ourselves than um, trying to figure out how this technology is going to be our means to our end or our curse. Because it, it really speaks more to a failure of ourself, a failure of our own collective consciousness, and a failure of um, our inability or our, our lack of appreciation of the, a life of reciprocity between ourselves and the, and, and the environment, or ourselves and ourselves. Also, when you talk about the future, uh, in which philosophical way are you putting the concept of future? Because uh, if you think philosophically, how do the Western civilizations experience time? Because now we're talking about time and temporalities. In the Jewish and Christian tradition that embodies, and Greek tradition that embodies the Western thought, uh, the image is like a, a, a set, how do you say, an arrow, right? That leaves the past in the direction of the future. Tonight we will like take the audience on a journey. We will present some of the ancient rhythms combined with uh, pure hypersonic beats and rhythms and uh, Gata will will represent her her special rhyme <laughs> something that the people will move to in this world and uh, we will show that it doesn't matter where someone comes from it's 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 not important everybody has their groups everybody has their their background we're from from a, another planet we came here but um it doesn't matter at all so that's what we are trying to do we will, we will make the people dance
I certainly think that technology is going to help immensely, you know, to diffuse access to production and engagement with knowledge. Um, I think that it's just the way the thing has evolved. Most of our elites are just the second play out of the colonial elites. Actually, to blame the colonial elites alone would be wrong. Most of our elites preceding the colonial elites also monopolize the power of knowledge. And so I think it's time to radically depart from that and to start to really, really challenge the, the spaces where knowledge, knowledge is created. The, 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 who, who needs to take on knowledge? We need to create parity of esteem between those who are artisanal and have craft capacity and those who make knowledge out of what they write. And in fact, if you start looking at it, written language, the written technology, which is books, is going to be have less efficacy as we go along. So actually leapfrogging this and start thinking about what are the alternative ways in which knowledge can be created and disseminated. The art of speculation is something that's invited to very few people as you become an adult, you know? So many people who are in speculative practices are either artists or architects or city planners where everything about their work and their daily job is th to think past tomorrow or past 10 years, past, you know, to 75 years and beyond. So, um, and, and also in thinking of education, I wondered how much of our education has been actually asking children, asking kids in classrooms about them being in the practice of using imaginative and critical thinking in, um, in their daily practice to imagine futures beyond what they see and what they experience right now. Right now, as we're having this panel discussion now, we're in somebody else's future. And that's why I believe that there is this idea of parallel universes and that past, present, and future all happen at the same time all at once, simultaneously, because right now, as I talk to you, I am in somebody's future, right now. And that now that just passed, and this now that I've just said, and the one that's gonna, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm in somebody's future, because even in a really, really simplistic sense, if they were to look at their time in South Africa right now, they'd be an hour behind me, so I'm in their future. I, if I return to the five artists in the exhibition, for instance, I think they found ways to, make their own experience, their own understanding of the world clear. Someone said to me at the opening of um, the exhibition last week that there are lots of women in the room by Mary Evans. And I said, well, yes, but there are more women than men anyway, so, I mean, what seems to be the issue? Somebody else pointed out to me that, well, all of the people in there are African. And I couldn't understand why this was such a revelation. Someone said to me, lots of things were said. Someone else said to me that, oh, I have never really considered a black angel when they looked at painting black Kimathi Donkel. And my response was, but, but why couldn't you? So I think the artists, they, they make these things present. They, they force a rethinking of whatever is deemed normality. Calling something knowledge can be a political or a radical act. Sometimes looking for knowledge in places others overlook can be a radical thing too. The question of, of, um, of what is knowledge? Uh, how is it produced? And how is it redistributed through society? is absolutely critical for those of us who are invested in rethinking Africa's potential uh, futures. I argue that we need to complicate this idea of who knows and who doesn't know, to recognize the subjectivity of it, to see how it shifts and changes depending on the circumstances, and to widen the field of knowledge production to include more ways of knowing, of expressing that knowing, of documenting and sharing that knowing, and ultimately of equalizing the value of various types of knowledge. It's my strong contention that knowledge produced through radical sharing is particularly relevant today. Today here in our country and to this world that we live in that is clearly in crisis, precisely because it comes from the outside of the dominant center. What comes to mind is Audre Lorde's idea that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house.
knowledge is a bit more than just an informed opinion. It is that which allows a society, a culture, to push back the frontiers of ignorance, of that which we do not know. When certain bodies produce knowledge, it, how it is labeled in such a way that it gets degraded as, as subjective, as opinion, as, uh, as emotional, uh, when other bodies produce knowledge, it's get, it gets labeled as, as legitimate, as fact. And this is done through different methods. Some of them academic, scientific, they require proof, uh, although they are open to contestation because knowledge has to keep uh, improving. We have uh, advanced as a people in the world, not just Africa now, but we have not moved forward. It's like everything is fast-paced, everything is shiny, everything is technologically high, but we really haven't moved. I'm your friend on Facebook, but we don't know each other in real life. We have never met, we're probably never going to meet. So we don't really have a friendship. We just have a chat every now and then. The African that I know, the Africa that I know, I mean, is structured in particular ways and in classes, in groups, and people in roles. And that seems to be forgotten by now. But this exposed me to understanding that you cannot build a future where people don't have their purpose within that society of the future that you're building. So everybody will have a role to play. I think the theme of the festival is very relevant to work that I do at Incibidi, especially because we're trying to interrogate society, we're trying to create a knowledge resource essentially for society and part of that is not just about history, it's not just about what we're actually generating in terms of contemporary society but it's also about how all of that informs the kind of society that we develop to in future. Now the interesting thing about Imaginary Lagos is that it extends on that by bringing together a more diverse set of actors and really focusing in on very specific elements of society, whether it's how our families are constructed, whether it's looking at more issues of mobility and transport. It's really trying to create a space where we can think and start imaginatively constructive these areas and use that as a way to get people, whether students, whether creative professionals, people from different disciplines to come and to essentially be in, involved in crafting those stories. I believe that art in Nigeria and art cultural production as well in Nigeria is going to be a lot more expansive. What we're finding is that people are moving more away from safe zones from traditional zones and whether because of our global connectedness or the fact that we now have more technologies available for us to express that and there's an actual growing market in art here in Nigeria we're seeing that people are pushing out and being a bit more um, conscious and also a bit more risque about the kind of, of topics and areas that they're exploring. The challenge is how can this process of imagination keep pace with the sense of urgency? Because everything needs a solution, like yesterday. So at this point, at least talking about my own country, it's really about trying to activate this small spaces, which are like spaces of resistance, really, but spaces of resistance that are negotiating with that handful of, of people who are actually controlling everything and who still have the power to decide who comes in and who goes out. Here's what I asked her. 
Pam, I want to use our collaboration as a starting point, and now I'm asking each of the project coordinators what radical sharing means to them. If I throw this idea of radical sharing to you, do you think we are just sharing, or do you think that there's something radical about it? Pamela, I think that is an important distinction, the difference between sharing and what you're calling radical sharing. How and when does sharing become radical? I think that the way we, we share becomes radical when your successes are literally my successes. That we stop seeing a distinction between the two. What has been so important about sharing a studio space is that anybody who comes in necessarily has to meet with or deal with or see both of us. I think that's radical. Straight sharing sometimes implies that something becomes less because you've divided it. Whereas radical sharing means that the thing becomes more because you are equally nourished by it. Rather than it being about a portioning out of what's available, it's more a pooling and an, and an augmenting of what's available. End of quote. When technology develops in the manner that it is right now, some of the unusual traits that humans have in the past, at least anecdotally, been able to demonstrate. For example, something in, in the realm of uh, maybe a prophecy or um, uh, extrasensory perception, things like those would be sort of poo pooed away. They just say, no, this, this can't be right, you know, rather than being studied. And I think that is a, is a shame of um, a scientific culture that very often will not accept something because it's not well understood and it's not, it doesn't sort of fit within the fully explainable. Well, the importance of, of Savi in Berlin is. Uh, well, to create a space where we um, where we can propagate different epistemologies, different knowledge forms from all over the place, not negating also the the, the knowledge structure in which we find ourselves. You know, it's a it's a, 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 a space for conviviality. It's a space, you know. Um, at a certain point in time, we thought. Um, we, we need to create a space to show the kind of art we like, propose the kind of discourses we want, but also we're very much interested in discourses from the South. And the, the, the so-called normal spaces, <laughs> of course we're not interested in those, you know. Or of course we're interested in a few names. But we're also not interested in going to convince them that actually these knowledge structures, these philosophers, these philosophies, actually those things that are important for you. We said, no, we create our own space and we talk about the things we want to talk about. You know, we, we, we propose the, no, oh, I say I want to talk about uh, Michel of Trio. I don't need to go ask your permission to do that. We do it. And here you come. We say we want to do a, something to commemorate uh, 130 years of uh, the Berlin Congo Conference, you know, the partitioning of the African continent. We don't need to go ask your permission to do it. We do it, you know. So Savi is that kind of a space, you know. But it's also a space where we share a lot of things. You know, I, I really found what Etenji said is, is very beautiful, you know. That possibility of sharing not as dividing. It doesn't become less, but it becomes more. So that's how sharing knowledge is. You know, because when you go out to the world and you scream, you know, it goes, it goes, you know. So multiplicity again, you know. So, so it's something that kind of a space where we want to share. I think that idea of the radical sharing, I was so happy about that. Albert If you don't know me, Google me. Uh, I am a dancer. I am an actor. I am a singer. I am a performance artist. So I studied at the University of Witwatersrand, where they colonize our minds. <laughs> so in dance class, you know, posture. Stomach in, chest out. <laughs> my teachers hated me. But they should see me now, I'm international. <laughs> 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 Of 
course, the interest in, in, in that thing called witchcraft, you know, is very, it's very much in line with this, you know, because uh, we want to look at these knowledge systems. We want to look at, so this witchcraft act, you know, it happened all over the world in written or unwritten structures, you know, but people that had this, this knowledge systems were persecuted all over the place. So how do you, um, you know, rekindle, how do you awake this knowledge, knowledge again? By creating, first of all, space to talk about them. Second of all, um, even making fiction out of them, you know. So giving space for, for, for truth, giving space for lies, giving, sp giving space for, for romance, for that kind of a, a third space structure, you know, where, uh, that space where people are, are talking in the corner, in, in, in little voices, but you capture that. I have a feeling that as we go forward and things get harder, that even those, uh, even those things that we claim as human achievements will start to be owned. And then that will be interesting because then on what grounds do Africans stand when they want to innovate? If you're going to use maths and physics, like who owns maths and who owns physics when, we, when push comes to shove? So I'm interested in that conversation about what African science is. To, to think about the future of Africa means automatically uh, to open up a space of interrogation concerning the future of the world at large and the future of our planet in particular. And the way in which we have inhabiting it uh, has been uh, uh, very uh, detrimental to its uh, durability, its sustainability, as well as to ours, humans. Questions such as the, uh, the crisis of climate change, the ways in which we exploit natural resources, um, all of that has a deep bearing on our capacity to keep reproducing life. Uh, so I would like to insist on the fact that the future of Africa is not only an African question, it is a planetary question.